Well, good evening, and thank you for the, the privilege and kindness of being invited to come and uh, speak to your church. Uh, this is a real privilege for me in a number of uh, ways. This has really uh, become a toy to house for me in a certain sense, a second home. Uh, it is true. I do almost consider myself, what, what I was called earlier today uh, by someone, we'll use the phrase, of, of him who shall not be named. Uh, his name's Bill. <laughs> he called me a, a, a wannabe Canadian reform minister. I, I think that was a compliment. <clears throat> uh, my family and I have come up here a number of times, different sides of the coast, mostly uh, on the east, and uh, really enjoy it. My son has declared himself an honorary Canadian. In fact, people tried to teach him the na national anthem and number, another of other things when we were here last. It was pretty nice. Uh, I was in Hamilton last week, and I'm not quite sure what all that sand was falling from the sky, but it was really cold. Uh, I shoveled snow, perhaps for the first time in my life I can remember with Ariane de Visser, and had a fantastic time. Uh, it was amazingly cold. Did I mention that it was cold? <laughs> so when I say I'm grateful to be here, I'm very grateful to be here. I'm also grateful it's a little bit warmer. I may be able to think more clearly. Uh, a few other things I would just like to say uh, thanks in regards uh, for. One is uh, <clears throat> I've been shown great kindness this morning, I was the reason that uh, Dr. Vischer was late, and he fell on his own sword. Uh, actually, he fell on my sword for me, so thank you for doing that. That was kind of you. Uh, Pastor Will uh, briefly showed you uh, the book that I wrote. There's a nice little connection there. Uh, when I finished that in Compton, I needed to find someone that could help with the editing, particularly the footnotes, a lot of which were Dutch, and I needed someone that was competent in Greek, Hebrew, uh, Dutch and English wouldn't be bad as well, and so actually uh, Pastor Den Hollander was the one that did the editing for me. What's fun about that is if you do choose to read it and you find any mistakes, <laughs> you know who to blame. So uh, he will happily uh, receive those, those emails. Uh, and another sweet kindness was given to me this, this evening, uh, which is uh, two people I used to pastor in Orlando, Florida, uh, 15 plus years ago, just showed up uh, out of the blue, and I guess live here, and I'm not sure where you're going to remember yet. Maybe you should keep that a secret, uh, at least until I go. There's more stories to be told there. Yes. All right, well, let's get into uh, our presentation for this evening. I think I've got a little lightsaber up here uh, by which I can navigate my way through these slides. And, all right, very good. Uh, so uh, this is my family. Um, uh, that's my wife, Heather. Uh, we've been married 22 years. Uh, beside her with the glasses is actually our oldest, even though she's not the tallest. Uh, the bane of her existence, perhaps, is that her younger brother is already taller. Uh, but this is my daughter, Kira Ruth. All four of my children are adopted. Uh, they are not biologically related to one another, and they each have really, really amazing stories. If you want to talk about adoption, we can just stay up all night and just chat. It's really one of my favorite subjects. Uh, and then our son, Carl Voss. Uh, by the way, he's named after a Dutch guy. That does make him at least, well, no, he's still not Dutch. And then uh, there is little Liam, who is two. His full name is William Warfield uh, Watkins. All the people are, I love are named William. <clears throat> Bill DeYoung is my new best friend slash worst enemy, and we've been sparring like this uh, quite a bit. There's nobody I enjoy disagreeing with more than him. Uh, so it's a shame I won't be here tomorrow and you'll have to miss the sparks, but that'll probably be generated later in the Q&A. So anyhow, uh, then here is our, our daughter. I think I've got, okay, yeah, this, I love this. I could, this is fantastic. Okay, so our, our newest is our daughter, Liara, um, who, just like all the other kids, came to us just completely out of the blue, really amazing, beautiful children. And uh, my wife has a wonderful way of saying it. She can't uh, conceive children naturally, uh, God broke our bodies to make our family. And so for me to stand here this evening and talk about parenting, uh, I, by the age of my children and for many other reasons, I'm no expert here at all. Uh, I've already learned a ton from you. Uh, I intend to learn more from you. Uh, but I do care deeply about the subject because I care very deeply about my wife and uh, our covenant children and want to see them prosper in the Lord as I know you want to see your covenant children prosper as well. So you can pray for our big crazy family. Uh, we may be about to adopt again. Uh, so when I left home, I had four kids. When I get home, <laughs> you just never know. 
All right, well, <clears throat> uh, I'd like to uh, begin the lecture by uh, talking about um, a couple things. The first is going to be my, my own uh, story, just, you know, how did, how did this crazy-looking guy get to be uh, an Orthodox Presbyterian pastor? I can kind of imagine it's grown to be a familiar dynamic to me. Uh, when some of you will come down and visit our church for the first time, uh, we do something kind of similar. We have that like bat cave door from the side of the sanctuary, and in come the elders and myself, and then I'll sit down the, behind the pulpit, and inevitably, you know, one of you might be visiting, and I'll, I'll watch one look over at the other and say, is that the pastor? <laughs> so <clears throat> so how, how did I get here? Well, in, in God's providence, this is a story I really enjoy sharing. It's a little bit unusual, uh, but it is true. And uh, in God's providence, I did not grow up a Presbyterian, uh, let alone a Christian. Uh, my family was a, a very uh, non-Christian family. My dad was a professed pagan and a career military guy. Uh, when I was 12 years old, he abandoned our family, left my mom to raise four kids. Uh, so my siblings and I were your typical American latchkey kids, which means mom worked, dad wasn't around, and we came home and got into all kinds of uh, rebellious and poor choices. So at age 12, uh, I began doing drugs. Uh, by the time I graduated high school, I'd been shot at twice, literally, uh, in gang problems uh, on the East Coast and on the West Coast. Uh, I have been in jail. Uh, I failed my senior year and had to repeat it. I was voted by my high school class, I'm a little proud of this, but not quite sure why, uh, most likely to live in a Volkswagen van forever. <clears throat> so you're not a very promising academic future there. Um, <clears throat> and in God's providence, uh, after high school, I moved down to the beach. I'm a surfer. That hasn't changed. I had dreadlocks down to here it's back in the day. And uh, after living on the beach for a year and just smoking pot, delivering pizza, I decided I needed to do a little bit more. So I got into a community college there, dropped out after the first year. And uh, not that I'm recommending this, I wasn't a great uh, career choice, but I dropped out of college to follow a band called the Grateful Dead around the country. Okay, so this is not Sunday morning and this is not an altar call yet, uh, but how many of you even know who the Grateful Dead are? Okay, yes, there will be an altar call for you later. Um, and, if, and if you don't know who the Grateful Dead are, you are not missing a thing. You truly are missing nothing. Uh, but after following the Grateful Dead around the country, literally for a year, living in campgrounds, selling and doing drugs, uh, I decided to go back to North Carolina and finish this college degree. And I got on a Greyhound bus to go cross country. And uh, God in his providence uh, put on somebody's heart to give me a Bible as I was getting ready to head cross country. And so I got on a bus, got a backpack to my name, that's it, and a guitar. And so for the first couple of days, I play guitar, my fingers uh, get just to the point where I can't touch the strings anymore. So I take out a Bible. My little brother's name is Mark. He's a little jealous. He has a whole book of the Bible named after him. Uh, but I began reading in the Gospel of Mark and actually believe that's where I met the Savior. Really unusual uh, conversion story, not the norm. Uh, but God is very gracious, he's very kind, I think he even has a sweet sense of humor uh, <clears throat> that he would save a wretch like me on a Greyhound bus trip following the Grateful Dead, literally on a road that leads to nowhere. There's a line in a Grateful Dead song that says, what a long, strange trip it's been, and it really has. So I came back to North Carolina, uh, uh, meandered my way through a few Baptist churches, was baptized uh, more than once. I was a real softy for uh, assurance of salvation. I really wanted that badly, so if it took getting baptized again, I would do it. If it took walking the altar again, I would walk it. If it took praying the prayer, raising my hand, doing whatever, I tried all that stuff. I was charismatic for about 15 minutes. <clears throat> that was plenty for me. And uh, after that, I discovered a little Bible church that had some nice uh, Reformed-esque type people uh, that really wrapped their arms around me, and it was a wonderful church family. There were men that just that just discipled me, spoke truth into my life, put their finger in my chest, uh, were men uh, to a young man that never really known the presence and influence of a godly man. And that church helped send me to Bible college. And in Bible college, you know, I was committed to being uh, pure until I got married and was praying. Uh, like so many of you young men probably have, uh, I was praying for a godly athletic hippie chick. She's in the first picture I showed you. 
That's my wife, Heather, now. It doesn't take at least one of those terms quite the way that I intend them, and uh, usually looks a little surprised when I describe her as a hippie chick, but she's godly, she's athletic, she's barefoot, and when, the day I met her, uh, just looked absolutely uh, lovely. And so um, when I was in Bible college, what was unique is that her dad was the president of my Baptist Bible college. A lot of this conference this weekend has been about things related to the subject of infant baptism. Uh, It's interesting listening to you have that conversation uh, because I'm guessing most of you grew up in the Reformed world. But when you are dating uh, the president of your Baptist Bible College's daughter, it's like being marrying, marrying into the Baptist Mafia. It was a big deal, and when I got to the point of beginning to wrestle uh, with covenant theology, it was an even greater deal. When I told my wife uh, in seminary, which is really when I drank the Kool-Aid and became not just Reformed but Presbyterian, I I can remember the day, she does too, and I told her I'd become a Calvinist, and she told me we were not going to have children. It was a bad day, and I I just kind of cuddled with the couch there for a while, uh, because that's where I slept. And her parents made a big rescue effort to try to win me back uh, to uh, a Baptist point of view. And I can say, uh, by God's grace, I became fairly persuaded of these things. And I would even say now, this might surprise some of you, but I I believe in infant baptism as much as I believe in the Trinity. I I really think it's in the text. And maybe that's a conversation uh, for later. That's not actually what my topic is about. Uh, But I want you to know that the idea of how we raise covenant kids, the idea of infant baptism, and the the idea of what it means to be a Presbyterian are are things that, at least in my story, were come upon uh, with some difficulty as well as some excitement. So what is a Presbyterian? Well, this is, a, this is a hard thing to define, at least in my point of view. I benefit a good bit uh, from what uh, Dr. Rayburn said earlier, just describing uh, some of the different practices. The way that I would describe it is Presbyterian is, is a little bit like a jellyfish or jello. Uh, in other words, when you describe a Presbyterian, you're, you're talking about a thing that can take on a lot of different shapes. Uh, in the world of Presbyterianism, I'm in the OPC. Uh, We have sister denominations. You probably know the PCA the best. Uh, Presbyterians have different views on a lot of subjects, and Presbyterians have different practices in a lot of areas. Uh, This picture here, by the way, is a picture of people from our church, and uh, these are all Orthodox Presbyterians. If you want to know what an Orthodox Presbyterian looks like, well, take a pick. (laughs) They look like anybody, all kinds of people. One of the unique things about our church is that for our, at least in, in our church, uh, which was a parachute plant, that means we were asked to move to an area and start from scratch uh, in church planning. By God's grace, now there's about 200 people there. It has its own property. It's been a really amazing story. Uh, but a lot of these folks don't come from Presbyterian backgrounds. Uh, this African-American couple here, some of the most beautiful people I know on the planet. Uh, Terrence is one of my elders, just a great guy. Uh, he's my height. He's 100 feet tall. He's an Orthodox Presbyterian elder. Uh, This young guy right here standing beside his wife, uh, he was a pot-smoking mess uh, in college when I met him. Uh, We did campus outreach there on college campus, and he actually came to Christ through our church's ministry, as did his his girlfriend, who is now uh, his bride, and now they're both Orthodox Presbyterians. He, by the way, just finished seminary and is headed to the ministry. So from wacko college kid self-professed atheist to OPC minister. God has a sense of humor, right? And so we can expect him to do big things. Uh, This fellow right here is our year-long intern who's about to be a church planner for us. We're about to plant three daughter churches in our greater area, and he's going to be the first church planner for us. Uh, He's Canadian, by the way, and we love him anyhow. So these are all Orthodox Presbyterians, and I think, you know, just to look at them, uh, you see some diversity, but that's really true. There, as it relates to the subject of raising children and views on the covenant, uh, views on communion, views on parenting, uh, there really is uh, a wide uh, perspective in American Presbyterianism. So let me, let me talk about a few things. I want to try to sprint towards what I think will be the most practical and edifying section of our presentation, uh, which I'll get to at the end with some pastoral reflections. But let me just talk a little bit uh, about the idea of making a credible profession of faith. Uh, This is an interesting practice for American Presbyterians, and as Dr. Rayburn uh, pointed out earlier, uh, it's not always been a monolithic practice. Uh, When American Presbyterians 
uh, developed in, in the States. Of course, they're coming out of Scotland. They're influences from England. Uh, there are all kinds of continental influences. And then you have what's referred to as the Awakenings, a uh, Second Great Awakening in particular, and this division that develops between old school and new school Presbyterians. The old school Presbyterians are very ordinary, means of grace focused. They have a very uh, predictable and a regular approach to the Christian life, and there was a division between them and what we could refer to as New School Presbyterians that had a little bit of an interest in this uh, Great Awakening theology that was now beginning to put a heavy emphasis on the idea of conversion. So in the one paradigm, you have a strong sense of assumption. Uh, these are covenant kids. They will grow up. They're in the covenant, kind of stay home. And as Dr. Rayburn pointed out, and I apologize for referencing him so many times, but he stole my thunder without asking. Uh, you have those who are really trying to press for, so tell me when you got saved. And that's a significant distinction there. One saying, you're in the covenant. We just assume that you'll remain there. The other saying, I need to know how you came to, to be saved and sort of pressing for this sort of decisionistic uh, approach to uh, the idea of covenant standing. And that creates a line of division in the church between old school and new school Presbyterians. It gets further complicated uh, when we have what's referred to as the civil war or the war between the states. And the reason why that complicates things is you now have Presbyterian young men killing Presbyterian young men in a war. Presbyterians in the north versus Presbyterians in the south. That's hard to drink in. And it also puts everybody back on the heels to try to ask the question, how can these things be? Like, what has happened to the church that we could be so fractured and so divided that you have people within the same theological envelope now uh, fighting one another? And as the church recoils from that, it takes steps back and it asks real deep, soul-searching questions about its piety, uh, about its place in the world. And for many, uh, the focus becomes one upon prayer and uh, evangelism, and uh, the church goes into this further uh, fractured state between those that have not only different views, old school, new school, you have Southern, uh, you have Northern Presbyterian and their uh, distinctions, and the church is working all this out. And one of the questions that they work out uh, is this idea of making a profession of faith of covenant kids. Uh, Peter Wallace says it helpfully this way, but as Presbyterians gradually adopted the New England practice of requiring a personal profession of conversion, they also began adopting the Congregationalist ritual of public profession as well. The Presbyterian form of government stated that the session had the power to receive members. Traditionally, this had been done by examination. The only public ritual that accompanied the admission of a person to the Lord's table was the Lord's Supper itself. And so Samuel Miller has a similar line when he says, Our fathers of the Church of Scotland know nothing of the public parade in the middle aisle now so common. So there's an interesting dilemma then or dynamic as American Presbyterians begin to not only have this idea of public profession of faith, but they do it in a sort of divided context between this outward and ordinary emphasis and what becomes a very inward and extraordinary emphasis. It's a good distinction. Uh, the outward and ordinary uh, becomes a contrast to the inward and the extraordinary. And this is why it's so hard to nail down exactly what uh, Presbyterians are. As regards piety, there are old school emphases on the outward and ordinary means of grace. As regards piety, uh, there's a strong emphasis on conversion. And do you have a spiritual experience, the inward and the extraordinary? So I hope that distinction makes sense. Another way of looking at it would be to say that in our theology, uh, there are some things that are like a dot on a page, and there's no wiggle room. The Trinity, the Gospel, how we're saved, personal work of Jesus Christ. For many things, there are, if you will, parentheses. And as long as you're within those parentheses, uh, you're okay. And American Presbyterians put a lot in between those parentheses and in that regard accomplish unity, uh, but not always uniformity. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, so now I'd like to come to what was a bit of a survey that I did. Okay, 
Uh, I'm going to skip that other question, come back to it later. Uh, this is a, a budding scholar in our home, uh, William Warfield, uh, who's doing empirical research with the children's catechism. One of the wonderful things I love doing is watching my children uh, finally outgrow uh, their idolatry. Uh, so we, you know, we go through the children's catechism together, and the question is, who made you? Gok! Well, it's God. Gok was one of the bad gods in the Old Testament. But he's working through that, and there's hope. Uh, so as we think about uh, some of these questions, let me tell you what I did. So I contacted uh, basically 20 churches, 10 in the OPC, 10 in the PCA, and denominational committees from each, asking them to give me answers to seven questions that I will briefly uh, survey for you. Some of these will, will be intriguing to you. Some of these you might uh, just kind of yawn your way through, but hopefully not too much. Uh, but a few of these I think will be intriguing to you. So the first question is, uh, at what age do you begin a communicants class for covenant kids? Uh, well, again, it's all over the map, but in some of the churches they begin literally as early as age four. Kids begin uh, membership classes uh, and others up to age 14, when they would start this class. Now, that, isn't that kind of startling uh, to imagine beginning so young, others beginning a good bit later? Uh, what is the process like? Uh, well, for many, they lean on things like the curriculum that you could find in uh, Sunday school material. Uh, sometimes these classes were very long. Sometimes these classes were very short. Sometimes uh, the, the elders would wait until a child says that they want to do this. In other contexts, uh, the elders approach the kids and say it's time to do this. In some cases, it's up to the parent to say, I think my child is ready to do this. So what you find is kind of a hodgepodge where there's no uh, one set pattern for how they get there. What role do parents, pastors, and youth ministries play in nurturing covenant children towards spiritual maturity? Well, again, uh, in different churches, you find different emphases. Every church quickly pointed out that the role of parents is significant and central, right? Uh, the, the idea of raising covenant children for making a profession of faith begins in the home with family worship. Uh, one of the things that was an interesting point of dialogue uh, on the other side of the planet last week is that when I say family worship, it's a little bit different than what you do, I believe. Uh, I love the practices that you have here where at the end of a meal, you'll read the Bible and pray together. I love it even more when there's Dutch apple pie in between the meal and the, and the Bible reading and the prayer. Uh, family worship in our context is usually uh, more of a singular event. You do it after most meals. Often for us, family worship is like after a meal. In our family's case, it would be after breakfast. Uh, the kids grab a Bible, a hymnal, a catechism, and we will read through the Bible together. Uh, right now we're finishing up the book of Hebrews. Uh, then we do catechism together as a family, and everybody's working on something. Uh, the little kids love asking mom and dad uh, their catechism questions. They, they love, we do the days of the month and the shorter catechism, and the upper level days are harder. So the kids love stumping mom, and especially dad. If I get the answer wrong, they'll correct me. But they're all working through catechism. Uh, and then uh, we will do prayer requests, where everybody shares a prayer request. Uh, and then we will pray. And then we will sing together, and we'll let one of the kids pick out a hymn or a psalm, and we'll sing together. We've got different ones, sometimes for different days of the week. And then uh, my kids would say their favorite part of family worship is what happens at the end. We wrestle. <laughs> I never win. And I love it. So that's a big part of the dynamic there is family worship. Of course, uh, the preaching of God's word is central, but that's sort of a truism to say, right, that preaching is central as we're raising our covenant kids. Youth ministry is one where it's absolutely all over the map. Uh, in American Presbyterianism, you have churches that are very program-driven. Uh, staffed youth programs are just a you know, sine qua non. It has to be there. Other churches, the exact opposite mentality. They're averse to youth ministry. Uh, they're very family-centric and would be reluctant uh, to hand off the raising of covenant kids to a paid professional. And I'll come back to that a little bit later here uh, towards the end. Okay? So you have a varying uh, level of practices. Uh, you also have something that's pretty significant, and that is Sunday school. And I was encouraged to explain this a little bit better. 
So Sunday school, <clears throat> in our context, means that before the worship service, although some churches do it afterwards, uh, there is a, you know, like an hour of teaching time that's often curriculum-based, and it's a part of our Lord's Day practices. So at our church, Covenant, uh, we have Sunday school at 945, we have worship at 11, and then we have evening worship at 5. And Sunday school is based on a curriculum. We're carrying kids through. Uh, there's excellent materials. Uh, Great Commission's publication, a joint effort of the OPC and PCA, has a K-12 through Christian education program, and we just push through the material uh, together. So again, you have quite a bit of variety in how all of this plays out. What subjects are covered? Uh, this, again, was an interesting question because in some cases uh, it was very thorough. In some cases it was very thin. In some cases it focused heavily on theology, Let's memorize a lot of Bible. Let's memorize catechism. Okay? In others, it was very piety-focused. So interesting. You can see how the old school, new school leanings uh, kind of play out there. What books are used in the communicant members' class? Uh, well, there are two that were, that were central for most churches. Uh, one is Confessing Christ, and the other is a book called Understanding the Faith. The interesting thing is that one of these books was written by an OPC pastor, and it's heavily used in the PCA. The other book is written by a PCA pastor, and it's heavily used in the OPC. Can you figure this out? Because <clears throat> the more I studied it, the more confused I got. All right, and then uh, several churches actually made up their own curriculum. Now, question number six is going to be the one where I wonder if I should duck. In fact, in Hamilton, I, I set up here like a little uh, landmine of my own just to kind of make it clear. Like when I go stand over here, I know this is where I may, I may explode uh, because this is a dangerous spot to be in. So this is going to be an interesting thing for you to process perhaps. But how old does a kid have to be before they can become a communicant member? Well, in some of the churches... Uh, the, the age limit on the higher end was upper teenage. Some even said, uh, we're fine waiting till college. On the way other side, all the way down to seven, and in some cases, four. And again, uh, this reflects a little bit of that historical dilemma uh, where you have some who are so heavily focused on the inward and extraordinary. Uh, they want to wait until kids get to a certain age and it becomes really super clear like they're owning this for themselves. This isn't mom and dad's faith. This isn't peer pressure. Uh, this is them owning this like grown adults and they're going to be voting members in the church and the whole nine yards. Others, uh, even some who are kind of pushing the pedo communion view, are viewing covenant kids as those that are already in the covenant. And why wouldn't you want to give them the means of grace? So both, I think, are driven by a very pious, godly uh, sentiment and even could make a good biblical case for their view. And that's why, again, in, in Presbyterianism, you often have parentheses and not simply a dot on the page. Okay? Uh, the last question, uh, what questions were asked during the interview process? Uh, this is uh, pretty simple. Does everyone have the handout? Okay. Yeah, so if you have the handout, I'm not going to read those vows. But if you look at them on the back side of the page, it has both the OPC vows uh, and the PCA vows. What was interesting is that for those who kind of went off script a little bit, some of the pastors uh, had like these long theological exams, like they were grooming these kids for elder, and they were intense. In other cases, it was literally just this simple, tell me about your love for Jesus, tell me about your love for the church. Those are the questions. And that was it. So quite a, a varying uh, process. One pastor even said uh, they don't even have an interview process at all. When the kid says they're ready to come, they just come. That was kind of interesting given what our polity says. Um, <clears throat> a, a mantra that exists, this will be a little bit debatable perhaps, and I'm not trying to make a big deal of this, but what's very clear is at the end of the day in American Presbyterianism, uh, we don't require what is referred to as confessional membership. Uh, that is to say, of a covenant child, if they have the gospel down straight and they can take those vows, then they are allowed to become members in the church. Uh, a proverb that I was introduced to early on is that the doors of the local church should not be narrower than the doors of heaven. Uh, that's actually a quote uh, from J.A. Hodge, What is Presbyterian Law? Uh, he was the first recorded that I know of to say that. 
Uh, maybe what might be even a little bit more intriguing to you as I begin to offer some pastoral reflections is the education model. It's intrigued me how much about this conference has been about education. It's been very edifying. Uh, I've learned a lot. I also appreciate how gracious you are with one another, uh, even in places where you disagree with one another. That, that's been modeled well for me, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, so in our church, this may dizzy you, uh, but we have all three models. We have public school families in our church, we have Christian school families in our church, and we have homeschool families in our church, and these are not shibboleths. Uh, these are not tests. There's no secret handshake. Are you one of those? No, we don't, we don't do that. In fact, uh, that sentiment is strongly discouraged. Uh, my family is a homeschool family. My wife uh, was actually homeschooled K through 12, and uh, you know she's in a generationally homeschool-oriented type of family. It works well for our family. It doesn't work well for every family. Uh, we have single parents in our church that are raising kids and working, and kind of hard to imagine how that would work out. But at the end of the day, uh, all of the models are there. Let me run down uh, just a handful of things I think will be hopefully helpful and edifying as we land the plane. Well, the first is just what I'm calling uh, re- confessions of a recovering youth pastor. Um, <clears throat> I'm seeing a counselor, and they say I'm making good progress. So when I was younger, I, I was a, a youth minister in some of my earlier education days. And one of the things that strikes me about American Presbyterianism is the extent to which it borrows from a lot of evangelical paradigms. Uh, I'm not anti-youth ministry, but I'm probably not far from it. I'm at least cautious. And if we're talking about raising kids, uh, the first three things here really relate to one another quite a bit. Uh, When I think about youth ministry, what I first want to refer to is the importance of pastor dad. And one of the things that I note Uh, is that with the advent and rise of youth ministry, program-driven ministry, uh, at least from my side of the water, it seems that the more and more the program-driven approach to ministry has risen up, uh, the practice of family worship and the presence of Pastor Dad has gone down. And I'm not okay with that. I'm not persuaded of that biblically. If there's going to be Uh, program ministries, they need to be that which supports and encourages spiritual leadership in the home, not that which supplants and replaces spiritual leadership in the home. So a big goal that I have uh, for young dads in our church, really, uh, I have very few goals. Sounds kind of bad to admit, but I have very few goals as a pastor. One of them is to see men leading in their homes. Uh, staggering statistics, I'm kind of off script here, but I I work best that way. Staggering statistic is that in in American churches, women outnumber men now two to one. In the African-American church, it's four to one. Where are the men? Where are the dads? Uh, Where are those who are raising up the next generation of spiritual leadership in the home? This is a crisis in my point of view, and it's, it's an irony then that the church with great intention, might actually be fanning the flame because uh, dads are not necessarily engaged as they need to be. Uh, it's also a bit of a concern to me that probably, somebody made a joke about, uh, I think I've heard it twice now, something about sixth grade teachers and, I don't know, they get like free drinks wherever they go um, because it's a challenging age group to work with. Uh, <clears throat> well, you know, high school kids, that's a volatile time in life with all due respect to any high school kids that are here. Uh, but it's a Hormones are raging, the world of ideas has gotten complicated, and uh, this is probably one of the hardest times of life to remain faithful, and we give them to somebody who's just a couple years older, usually single, not even elder, not theologically trained, looking for a spouse. Help me understand how this is a great idea. This is like juggling hand grenades, and you know one of them has a pin pulled. I mean, there's, this thing blows up quite a bit. The attrition rate is terrible. They last about two years normally. Uh, the problems are, are, are legion. So I'm not anti the paradigm. It sounds, again, I was honest, pretty close. But I'm concerned, and I think we need to reform the way we think about youth ministry. It begins by reforming the way we think about the family. So cards are on the table there. We have, so I'm not a hypocrite, uh, we have a grassroots youth ministry in our church that's actually led uh, by a Canadian Reformed couple, 
Uh, technically, the wife is Canadian Reformed. Uh, the husband's from Australia. Was it free Reformed? Uh, he's one of our elders. And at least in my view, a viable way to do this is not a staff person per se, but just a faithful family that's not going anywhere. We've got a solid husband, a solid wife. They're raising their kids in the covenant. They're doing things well. And they're just modeling healthy Christian life. And they will be there for those covenant kids. They will love them and come alongside them. So a grassroots, family-centric approach uh, to youth ministry is what I'm humbly suggesting. And again, not anything that displaces pastor dad. I I really want to recover that. Like This is a big deal to me. Can't overemphasize it. Uh, Sunday school and second service. So we have Sunday school and we have second service. I remember uh, until we had our second service, when we were meeting in an elementary school, we couldn't come back in the evening. So we had this morning service and then we had a, like a small group in my house on Sunday evenings. And occasionally somebody from up here would come down and say, where's your second service? And I would say, we don't have one. We have a Bible study. And they would kind of look down on me just a little bit. And I would ask them, by the way, where were you during Sunday school? And they would say, what's that? And I would say, well, it's kind of like what your evening service began as, but we're doing it before instead of at four. And they would say, let's have apple pie and we'd be friends again. The necessity of evangelism and apologetics. I think this is big. This is one place where I want to just take a minute. This might invite some interaction afterwards. Um, this, this could be a, a distinction. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but a distinction uh, in, in the way that we're working some things out. So as I mentioned, we already have in our churches public school, private school, and Christian school. I think one of the things that you'd find, as largely speaking, a common denominator in our approach to raising covenant kids is not simply apologetics, but also evangelism training. The distinction I want to make is, in my mind at least, this is probably not a perfect uh, way of thinking about it, but apologetics to me is largely defensive. You are giving a defense of someone who is asking of you. This is the first Peter 5 language. Always be ready uh, to give a defense to anyone who asks. It's teaching our covenant kids, how do you... You know, how do you continue to believe in the face of science and secularism and atheism and evolutionism and all that kind of stuff? That's apologetics. I think we all do that. Evangelism is more like a Colossians 4, 5, 5 through 6, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. So it's an offensive posture where you are teaching people, in particular our covenant kids, uh, to engage the mission field. Uh, for us, and I, should, I don't mean to create a we, they, but uh, for us, uh, there's no question that the church is under attack. There's no question that our covenant kids feel an immense amount of pressure. Even in the feedback that I got uh, across the board, uh, people are very clearly committed to the idea that covenant kids need to be trained, not simply in how to defend their faith, but how to engage non-Christians and to actually reach out for them, uh, reach out to them. Some of the best evangelists in our church are under the age of 20. And as a pastor, one of the greatest feelings in the world is when a teenager brings a non-Christian friend to church and I get to preach to them because they're trapped. They're not getting out of that door until they hear the word of God preached and I know our church is going to love on them. Some sweet lady is going to try to grab them and take them to lunch. Uh, So I think there's a very important nuance here, uh, the idea of not simply training for apologetics, but training uh, for active, offensive, if you will, not offensive, but uh, evangelism. Uh, We would kind of see that as a necessity for the survival of the church. Discipleship, uh, this is a category we all believe in, uh, but you know, when I think about our church going back to an early picture, our church is the first church for a lot of families. Uh, Our church is close to a multi-ethnic area where there are a lot of broken homes. Uh, Discipleship is a big deal. One of the real positives about the youth ministry movement is that for a lot of kids that are latchkey kids like myself, single-parent home kids uh, like myself, it might be the closest they get to having a dad. And so a big emphasis in our circles is discipleship. Right? And not just me as a dad discipling my own kids, uh, but in our house every week are kids, teenagers, that don't have dads. And they think of me as their dad. Uh, there's a young man, a uh, young African-American kid in our church uh, who slips all the time and calls my wife mom. 
on his birthday, I get a little emotional just thinking about it, what he asked for was that she would take him out on a lunch date. Because we're their family. Uh, and the church, right, is a family. And for our covenant kids, uh, not only do they have biological family, uh, but they have the church family, right? Uh, but if you're a kid off the street and you come into the church, this literally may be your all family. This could be the closest you have to a real family. And that's probably the case for a lot of kids in our uh, context. Last two points I'll make, and I'm, I'm really close to being on time, um, uh, is to say I'm an ordinary means of grace guy. <clears throat> so in a nutshell, just speaking for myself as a pastor, as a dad, uh, what is my approach to youth ministry and raising up covenant kids? Where's my hope and confidence? Well, I believe in family worship, uh, but I believe in the means of grace. The preaching of God's word, the sacraments and prayer are, are really what we ought to have confidence in. Uh, the catechism talks about that outward and ordinary means by which God not only saves, he sanctifies. And I would say this to you who are young and you who are old, uh, I would love to see a reformation, a recovery of confidence in the word preached. One of the reasons why I believe American Presbyterians and evangelicals are so inclined towards programs is because we've lost our confidence in God's program, which is the means of grace. We think too little of preaching. We treat uh, the sacraments as this kind of afterthought. And uh, we regard too low that which God actually seems to think pretty highly of. And so I, I push this a lot. We're an ordinary means of grace church. I want my kids to grow up with that vocabulary. You know, I want them to be committed not to a church that has the programs and the kids their age or stuff like that. That's all well and good. But tell me about the means of grace. Are you striving for an ordinary means of grace church? Last thought. No silver bullet parenting. It's been a conference on parenting. The nice thing about saying this, by the way, right now is my time's up. I'm going to go home soon. And uh, tomorrow morning I get to fly away and I'll be safe. But I'd like to just suggest that uh, it's important for us to remind ourselves uh, that, like the disciple said, after we've done all we can do, okay, paraphrase, even as parents, we're still just weak and unprofitable servants, right? Uh, I can remember uh, years ago, uh, a family husband rolling in, his wife in a wheelchair. Uh, she had MS. My older sister is, is failing right now with MS. Uh, and I remember this man walking his wife in, pushing her, and they were coming out of a charismatic church where they'd been told multiple times if they just had enough faith, she would be well. And she wasn't well. What was the problem here? Did she just not have enough faith? Did God not keep his promise? Well, I think that Reformed folks at times can have their own version of uh, that charismatic, if we believe that if we just do the right things as parents, our kids will come out okay. As a dad, that's scary theology. If it goes well, will you claim credit? If it doesn't go well, will you crash like this family? Uh, we entrust our covenant kids to God and his promises, and we lean on those promises, but we remember at the end of the day, uh, it's God alone who can work in the heart it's God alone uh, who we believe uh, will save and sanctify our covenant kids. And it's God who works through those means that he has appointed to preserve our covenant kids in their faith as well.